pray God for backsliders to come back. We pray for the addicts to be set free, God. We pray, God, for families that are broken up to be mended. God, I pray that those who leave your future leave. And then when they came, God, I pray, Father God, that all fear right now would begin to leave and subside.
sponsored by all denominations, different churches, joining hands and saying, we're just putting everything to the side and going to worship the king. That's what I love about these revival classes. There's, there's so many different people, so many different people that's come from. And that is what we've got to be. I'm going to preach. I'm going to be in Hebrews chapter 9. But that's what we've got to do in these last days. We got to be his kingdom focus. We got to focus on growing his kingdom, not our kingdom. And if we'll focus on growing his kingdom, he'll work out the rest. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 9, my wife says, I don't ramble. I don't have to ramble and, and meddling, but I like to, I like to talk to you. I love God's people. Brother Tillman, I, I love God's people. I love church. It'll never enter my heart to say, well, we got to go to church. Get that out of your heart. Be like David say, I was glad when they set up me. Let us go into the house of the Lord. There ought to be something on the inside who says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, get churchy. <laughs> Church. Church. Church is important. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services, but into the second part, the high priest went alone. He went along once a year without, or excuse me, the high priest went along once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Now, I'm going to... Uh, Skip around a little bit. I didn't give you all of these, but I find it important at this moment to read on in these scriptures. Verse 12, chapter 9, verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We go to the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews and the 11th verse. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected for those who are being sanctified. Let's stop there with our Heavenly Father. I come to you in desperate need of the anointing of the Holy Ghost to teach and to preach the engrafted word of God as the Spirit would have it spoken. And the church said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask for some help. If y'all can just come sit in the choir along behind me, Brother Michael. 
if you would come help me, Brother Nick. If y'all just come throughout this message, I'm going to need I'm going to teach tonight. I know that uh, that it's uh, expected out of me to spit and holler and scream and, and twirl around. But I'm going to try not to do all that until I completely can't pull it back anymore. I'll just put it that way. But I want to teach you something. My granddaddy was in a service in Douglas, Georgia. Uh, do you have a little time that I'm going to hurt him? It ain't, it ain't that I don't, I don't just won't take up time, but I've got a lot to say. But my granddaddy was in a service in Douglas, and uh, the pastor, or well, the evangelist there, was screaming and preaching and dancing and jumping and hollering. He was on the front row like Kevin and, and uh, Lindsay, and they see them there. They got all up jumping and shouting and hollering, and when it kind of cooled off a little bit, they all sat down, and Papa leaned over, and he said, what did he just say? <laughs> They said, I don't know, but it sounded good. <laughs> so I want you to know what I'm saying tonight. Papa took off running at camp meeting last time we had the type of night before, before it burnt down and was sitting over in this area. He took off. I will, God just healed him of the of prostate cancer. And he, I mean, it got the red hot burning. You know, he took off running. and got over there about where Vicky's at. The type of night was huge. You know, he got way over there. And by then, it done cooled off. Everybody sat back down. And their papa is over there. You know, but his seat's over here. He asked Brother Calvin Evans. He said, what am I going to do now? I'm way over here. He said, wait till he says something good again and take off and run back to the seat. <laughs> so you'll have the chance to run in a minute. And if you get caught on one side, just wait. I'll say something good and you run back. <laughs> Only us fanatical, spirit-filled people. The mercy seat. The message tonight is redemption hidden in the ark. The mercy seat of the ark of the covenant was kept inside the holy place of the tabernacle. It was separated by a thick veil from other parts of the temple. This is the place of the temple that could only be entered into by the high priest once a year on Yom Kippur in the, the day of atonement. To, to serve God and to be in right standing with God at this time was very different before what we're going to celebrate here in a few weeks, before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection when he said it is finished. It was very different then. Man was under the dispensation of law. Over 600 Levitical laws, and you heard uh, you heard from the prophet about that all of the uh, man-made laws that the Pharisees and Sadducees come up with, about 1,300 of them, there were sacrificial offerings that had to be brought to God for the for failing God. God was not dealing with man as he's dealing with, with man now. They was under the dispensation of law. The world was under this dispensation, but Ephesians teaches us uh, in the first chapter in the 10th verse uh, that through the dispensation of the fullness of time. God would put all things together in Christ, not anything else but in Christ. Now the high priest, he would go on Yom Kippur, he would go into the Holy of Holies. He wore white linen garments. It was a very serious matter. It was a very serious time. And it was there he would go in with the blood and he would take and dip the hyssop, a type of branch and plant, and he would dip it into the blood, and he would sling it onto the mercy seat, which rests right here tonight. And he would take the blood, and he would sling it on the mercy seat. Hebrews 9 and 7 says, but only the high priest would enter the room once a year, never without blood, to offer a sacrifice for the sins of himself and the sins of his people. We know that this was a serious matter when he would take and he would come and he would sling that blood. And we know that if God accepted that blood, if God accepted that sacrifice, the Shekinah glory of God would confirm and would fall down into that holy of holies. And he would accept the sacrifice and the blood that was given. He Hebrews 9 and 1 says the old covenant had ordinances and it had divine services and it had a worldly tabernacle. You had the outer court, you had the bronze.
child's labor where the priest would wash his hands. You have the holy place, the sanctuary, and then you have the holy of holies where this article right here in front of me rested. Now, now I know you think Indiana Jones had it, but uh, this is it right here. Amen. You see this, and I listen, I want to put a disclaimer. I want to put a disclaimer. Because I preached using this at our church about a year ago. And somebody commented and said, how dare you take such a precious article of faith and, and just so take it so lightly and touch it. We, we march around the church with it. Listen, this is Lowe's and Home Depot <laughs> and Backyard Sweat. It's nothing but a prop, okay? Don't get all religious tonight. Super spiritual. If they were anything to it, they, these men probably be dead by now. <laughs> it's an illustration. You had the veil in the temple. Somebody say the veil. This is going to be important. You had the veil. The veil was 60 foot long. It was 30 feet wide and 4 inches thick. It took 300 priests just to hang this veil. It was a thick veil. It was a big veil. So why is all this necessary, Brother Tyler? Why are you teaching on something that's not even, even relevant to us today? Oh, it's relevant. Because once you understand the redemption that was hidden behind the, in the ark and the redemption that's in this story of the Holy of Holies, you'll get a better understanding of what we can experience today. Because Hebrews 8, Bible says this old tabernacle stuff is a copy and it is a shadow of what is in heaven and it is a picture and a type of Christ so you will understand what Christ's death, his burial and his resurrection really means. You understand now before we go any further that the blood would be carried in only by the high priest. He would sprinkle the blood with his upon the mercy seat. If God didn't uh, accept the sacrifice, boom, he'd be dead. They had to drag him out by a rope. But if God accepted it, the glory and the Shekinah power of God would fall into that holy of holy place. And he would come out there would be trumpets and shofars and leaping and dancing that yes, Another year we're going to be blessed in the city. Another year we're going to be blessed in the field. Another year God has wiped our slate clean. He has accepted our sacrifice and forgiven us yet another year. And there was a mighty time of rejoicing. But when Jesus Christ came, He came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And He could come to put an end to the ordinances of the law. And He come to put an end to the sacrificial system. He come to put an end to the shedding of goats and bulls and, and calves and turtles. Does. He come to put an end to that. He would say things like, my hour has not yet come. My time has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Somebody said, what hour was he talking about? The hour where the world's sinless man would hang and pay a sinner's price. The hour in which the spotless blemishless Lamb of God would hang and take upon himself the sins of the world. Hallelujah. But now, when Jesus Christ lived a holy life and he became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He opened the blinded eye. He walked on the water. Hallelujah. He unstopped the dead he rebuked the Pharisees. He came and he prophesied. And he, hallelujah, came and fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies by Isaiah, who said he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, that the chastisement of our peace would be upon him, and by the stripes upon his back we would be healed. And now he came and he hung on that old cross. He stretched his arms to the east. He stretched his arms to the west. And as he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, he said, it is finished. And when he said, it is finished, that four inch thick, 60 foot 
foot wide bell was ripped from top to bottom. Hallelujah. And now, praise God, the glory that rested only behind the veil is about to be released. No longer a barrier, but an open door. Everything you need to know about the blood. Somebody say the blood. Everything you need to know about atonement. Somebody say atonement. And everything you need to know about sacrifice is wrapped up in this one word. And somebody say substitution. Substitution means that it should have been me on the cross. But it was him. It should have been me that walked up here that I love somebody. It was him. It should have been me with the sword in my side. But it was him. It should have been me that took the beat. But it was him. Somebody said, I've never done anything bad. Oh, but she was born in the sin. And by your birth, you made it a savior. You may not ever hurt anybody. You may not ever stole from anybody. You may not be a cusser. You may not be a bar hopper. You may not be a harmonger. You may Has 
and apply the blood to the mercy seat. And everything God does is in decency. Everything God does is in order. His word shall not lie. And it shall not return void. And he's trying to make a top and a shadow of the old tabernacle. But through his blood. Oh yes, he walked the earth. He was seen among men. Hebrews 4 and 14 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us in our weakness, but in all ways tempted as we are, yet he never sinned. Somebody say he never sinned. How many of you know we've got a high priest by the name of Jesus? We've got a high priest who knows what you're going through. We've got a high priest who sees the tears that you shed. He knows the stomach pains that you have. He knows your children are running wild. There's no need to call a 1-800 number. There's no need to go find you a tear card reader. There's no need for you to get you a crystal ball. There's no need for you to send a thousand dollars to a crooked TV minister who's just going to steal your Yeah. 
have the power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. They're up in that upper room wailing. They're praying. They're in travail. They're praying and they're praying in travail. And then all of a sudden, somebody say all of a sudden. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven. When that blood touched that mercy seat, there was a release of the glory of God. And there came and a mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared under them clothed in tongues of fire and it sat upon each of them and they all began to speak in other tongues as the spirit gave the utterance some were speaking a little Egyptian some were speaking a little Hebrew some may have been speaking a little Swahili all I know is this is that there was some men there laughing and they said these men they got to be drunk on wine. They're staggering up and they're falling on the floor. But Peter stood up with a loud voice. He said, these men are not drunk as you suppose. Because it's nine o'clock in the morning. He said, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. That in the last days God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. You know me. sin. 
And you will sin. That's in your Bible. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Because the blood has been put on the mercy seat. There's a story in the Bible. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 6, I believe. And there were some men that did what these just did. They said, I'm not going to preach all these notes if you're getting scared. I'm actually skipping a bunch. The men of Beth Shemesh said, we're going to see what's in there. That's right. We're going to see what's in there. And they removed the mercy off of the law. Here you go. Here's your something to do. They're supposed, they're supposed to be broke, aren't they? Stand up for everybody. Hey, look at this lighting idea. <laughs> take the mercy and the blood off the law and all you're left with is law. Right. The Bible says that brings death. Right. That brings death. And I've got five messages in one. I should have probably stopped there, but I wanted to get this. I loaded this thing up. It's not pretty as Pastor Baldwin <laughs> He's got a beautiful one over there. And you take, and it killed him. You take mercy off the law. Amen. This has kind of been the theme that these messages just went through this past week. So all, you're, all, all you have is law and tradition, and law and tradition, and law and tradition. You're not left with anything but death. Oh, There's been a lot of churches died out because they didn't want to show anybody any grace or any mercy. We sing a song that says, I need your mercy. I need your grace. Well, Leading the way, I can't make it without you. Not for one day, I need your mercy. I do. I do. I need this mercy. One, a couple more things. You have the law represents sanctification and separation. What makes us different than the world is we live according to the Bible. You had the man. This is part two. Papa and Brother Baldwin had five parts. I don't have but three. Yeah. Zach had a part the other night. The man is a type of the shadow of Christ. Son of Christ. The man is enough. The man is enough. Somebody say, the man is enough. Yeah. Jesus is enough. When they was in the wilderness, they began to complain. Oh, we got this man. We had jubilee watermelons in Egypt. We had sweet corn in Egypt. We had cucumbers in Egypt. We had all we had. All we got is this man. We had Aaron's rod. Not only Aaron's rod, Aaron's rod did good. We all want the presence of God, the glory of God, the power of God. We all want what these things seem like. We got to do it in order. You got, you got to have all of this. You, you, I've heard people say, "Well, I want Jesus, but I don't want that Holy Ghost." You 
you got, if you want Jesus, it's the Holy Ghost that brings you to Jesus. Let me just let you know. It's the Holy Spirit of God that brings folks to Jesus. And it is Jesus that baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. And so I don't want this. I don't want that. I, I, we, we're in a day and age where there's so many schisms and problems and, and people fussing about all these little things. And here's where we've come to. We've come to where people want all they want is all glory. They want all spirit. J. Frank Cooper said, if all you got is all spirit, you're going to blow up. And there's people that all, all hold them up high. That's all they want right there. All they want is law and not law. All they want is word, 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 and no spirit. Jesus said the words that I speak to you, they're spirit and they're life. So you got, you got all spirit and no word, you're going to dry up or you're going to blow up. You got all word and no spirit, you're going to dry up. But if you got word and you got spirit and you got the bread of life, you got Jesus and you got all you're going to grow up. And we all need to grow up. Redemption's hidden in this ark. John 6, 51 says, Jesus said, I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. He said in the sixth chapter, all through that I'm the bread of life, the bread, the man of life from heaven. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Inside of this ark, these conflicts, and everything is that nothing God does is for no reason. And it points us to a way. Pastor Zach, if we want the glory that rested behind the veil, you can't have the glory without the blood. You can't have the glory without the word. Amen. You can't have the glory without Christ. You, you can't, you, you, you got to take it all. Amen. He said, I didn't come in part, I won't receive in part. Yeah. You have to have it. I want it all. I want it all. Y'all come to the music if you would, please. There's one more story that I want to preach tonight as they come. Y'all put the contents back in and put the lid back on, please. Philistines was Israel's enemy. They went to war. The Philistines won the battle. They said, let's take their precious Ark of the Covenant. Eli heard of the death of his two sons, the news that the Ark had been stolen, and he fell and died of a rope neck. He was out of shape. Terrible. The Philistines brought the ark in their temple and sat it next to David on the false god of the Philistine. And it seemed like a good idea but until two things happened. Twice, two nights in a row, they got fell down and was mysteriously broken. And I don't know why we so hung up on hemorrhoids, but the second thing is they all got hemorrhoids. It's in the Bible. God has a sense of humor. God was showing his power and his authority to the false systems yeah. of the world. So the Philistines built a new car for the ark to be carried on. They wanted to get it back. They was tired of him. They seen firsthand, don't mess with Jehovah God. The God of the Israelite system. We've had enough. Twenty years the Ark of the Covenant would rest at Abinadab's house on a new car. Somebody say it seemed like a good idea. 
David comes along and says it's time to bring it back. So I said, everyone agreed. Everyone agreed the intentions was good. I, I tried to preach about four messages in one tonight because I want to get this. So we're, we're narrowing it. That's bittersweet, David. We're narrowing it down. Got two more nights at New Vision and Homerville. They got it on the car, but it wasn't to be carried on the car. God didn't want to carry it on the car. God was worried it wasn't carried on the car. But it didn't seem like a good idea, and I find it very interesting that the Bible talks about everyone agreed. The times has changed. It's a new day. It's a new hour. It's a different generation. You know, we got to rethink and redo some things. There's a way that is good, that is pure, that is holy, and is of the Bible. And it is to be stayed in, not veered away from, but it seemed like a good idea. They brought it on the carpet. They wouldn't be carried on the carpet. The glory and the presence of God only comes by one way. And that's God's way. When you obey His commandments. You obey His word. Every church should have a balance. Every preacher, every minister should have a balance in the word and the spirit. And holiness and righteousness and sound doctrine. This modern day system that is wanting that glory that rested behind the veil. They want that glory. They want that power. They're desiring it. But they're trying to get it through these avenues. It's unbiblical. They're trying to get it by telling people just live like you want to six days a week. Just show up on Sunday. It don't work that way. It don't work that way. They're telling people you got to you got to get up there and you got to turn your hat on backwards and, and put on some skinny jeans. And, I mean, you know how good we are love the skinny jeans. Rednecks don't wear skinny jeans. Nothing, I'm not preaching against skinny jeans. I'm preaching against adding it to the recipe and the formula for revival. It just has nothing to do with the glory of God. In a, in a lowest time, really, 
of my life so far when I was in the tug of war between the call of Brother Rusty and running away from it, doing my own thing. I said, right, Pastor Walter, I said, I've had enough. I put that combine in neutral right there between them two tobacco rows. I said, God, I want you to touch me right now in such a way I'll never contemplate running from this call again. And the glory that rested behind that veil fell between two. Don't you lend it, my God, to a church house, to a tent revival.